Shivram. Yeah. Good to go. You can start. Spawn out of action. Located in Chennai, Tamil Nadu, Indian Institute of Technology Madras has been living up to this belief since 1959. The uniqueness of IIT Madras lies in world-class modern facilities and state-of-the-art labs, innovation ecosystem, incubation cell, leadership in IP and industrial consultancy. Innovation and entrepreneurship are amongst the key areas of the focus at IIT Madras. Our incubation cell is India's leading deep tech startup hub and has incubated about 200 startups to date. IIT Madras retained its position as the top innovative educational institution in the country for the second consecutive year in the utter ranking of institutions on innovation achievements. We are leaders in intellectual properties and have filed around 1,500 plus patents over the years. We have emerged as the country's leading technical institution in creating new knowledge as 189 patents were filed in the financial year 2019-20. IIT Madras is also at the forefront when it comes to industrial consultancy undertaken by educational institutions in the country. All this and more has led to IIT Madras to be ranked as the topmost engineering institute by National Institutional Ranking Framework for five consecutive years. Overall, IIT Madras performs great across. has been privileged to host many international students from all over the world. Most of these students come for their exchange programs to either do their coursework, research work, or their thesis for a period of six months to one year. with a lot of doubt about being in a different environment, but a pleasure of being in this place. In all my courses, I found wonderful friends who helped me, and I never go alone or being outsider. <laughs> IIT Madras researching opportunities, and I've been given the opportunity to work in testing the main sensor of the of the satellite. This is just one of the biggest big projects that IIT Madras is holding now today, and I'm really happy to have chosen this this opportunity to come here. <laughs> can actually know whether you are passionate about this or not because you'll have the time and also opportunity to explore each and everything.
So thank you for the wonderful video, Shivram. Uh, I think we can get get it started. Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome uh, to everyone. We appreciate you being here with us today. And it's nice to see you all here again. So as I've been telling uh, in the previous webinar that uh, the IRIS webinar series is gaining a momentum in the public domain. And it's my pleasure to happily share that we have already crossed thousands and thousands of registrations and participants. So the main idea behind these webinar is to showcase the innovative research being generated at uh, IIT Madras uh, to various stakeholders like researchers, industrialists, and policymakers. And yes, we are here again, and it's our pleasure to uh, present the eighth webinar, uh, which is computer vision in the IRIS webinar series uh, under the cluster sensing and vision. So the research initiative under the computer vision technology project is led by Professor A. N. Rajkopalan. To say a few words about Dr. Rajagopalan. <clears throat> so he's a Starlight Technology Chair Professor in the uh, Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Madras, and also head the Image Processing and Computer Vision Lab. So he's a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering, fellow of the Alexander Own Humboldt Foundation Germany, and also the fellow of uh, Institution of uh, Electronics and Telecommunication Engineers. So he has served as the associate editor of IEEE Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence from 2007 to 2011. And also uh, as the associate editor of IEEE Transaction on Image Processing from 2012 to 2016. And also as a senior area editor for IEEE Transaction on Image Processing since 2016. So he is the recipient of DAE SRC Outstanding Investigator Award in 2012. So uh, the Vaswick Industrial Research Award in 2013 and the, the Mid Career Institute Research and Development Award from IIT Madras in 2014 and the Google India AI ML Faculty Research Award in 2018. It goes long and long. His uh, research uh, activities are funded by MHRD, DST, DAE, DRDO, AFRL, and KLA Tenka from USA, Google India, Adobe from USA, among others. So he had uh, held visiting positions at the University of Maryland, Technical University of Munich. So Professor Raj Gopalan's current research interests include uh, recovering shape from X, image restoration, image forensics, underwater imaging, deep learning, multimodal learning, and sport analytics. Mm -hmm. Uh, so joining Professor Raj Gopalan as a speaker today's of webinar. Thank you, sir. So we also have Dr. Rama Chalapa has joined as the moderator. Well, uh, he is a Bloomberg a Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. So before joining JHU in August 2020, he was a Distinguished University Professor at Minta Martin, a Professor of Engineering, a Professor in the EC Department, and the University of uh, Maryland Institute Advanced Computer Studies at uh, UND. So he's a recipient of 2020 IEEE Jack S. Kilby Signal Processing Medal. Uh, he is also a recipient of the KSFU Prize from the International Association of Patent Recognition. Uh, he also received the Technical Achievement and Meritorious Service Awards from the IEEE Computer Society. Recently, he was recognized as with the inaugural leadership award from the IEEE Biometric Council. He's a fellow of IEEE, IAPR, OSA, AAAS, ACM, and AAAI. So he served as the editor in chief of IEEE Transaction on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence. He has served as a general and technical program chair for uh, several IEEE international and uh, national conferences and workshops. He's a Golden Co member of the IEEE Computer Society and served as the distinguished lecturer of IEEE Signal Processing Society. He served as the I inaugural president of the IEEE Biometric Councils too. So Professor Chalapa's current research uh, interests are computer vision, machine learning, artificial intelligence and signal and image video processing. So it's my pleasure to invite you both to this uh, session, Professor. Over to you, Dr. Chalapa, thank you. Professor Chalapa? Yeah, hi. Yeah. 
yeah you can uh, you can leave the session be the floor is yours okay oh thank you um, all right um, raju we are all waiting to hear from you i guess you're going to uh, give a presentation and uh, uh, those in attendance can put your questions in, in the chat and uh, so it's about 30 minute presentation is it right right it's about okay. it's about uh, yeah. Well, see, 30 minutes yeah 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 go ahead please thank you Thank you, Professor Chalapa. Uh, this is Raj Gopalan. I am a faculty in the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Madras, and uh, I head the IPCV lab at IIT Madras. And uh, I am here to share a research initiative on this prospective center of excellence in computer vision. Uh, and uh, I will, I will, I'll try to move on to my next slide. I mean, are you able to see my slide, by the way? Um, no, we we don't. I don't see your slides. Okay. Uh, okay. Then maybe maybe. Okay. Let me just start sharing it because for some reason. Um, one minute. Okay. Let me see. Uh, just a second. Let me let me get the screen sharing going. Uh, well, this I'm clicking on the Zoom link, but for some reason, some reason, uh, would you need any help, Professor? Uh, yeah, I mean, my yeah, Zoom probably, yeah, yeah. is uh, have you locked my screen or something? Because uh, I'm not, no, uh, no, yeah, I'll just try to uh, unspotlight you. Uh, yeah. Naresh, can you please do that? Because my Zoom, when I click on it, it doesn't seem to do anything at all. Uh, Mr. Naresh? Yeah, I've uh, removed the spotlight. OK, sir, uh, I think uh, just minimize, or else uh, uh, you can just uh, minimize the screen and open it again. Okay. And then try to uh, share the, click on share screen. Yeah, when I click on the Zoom link, right, it doesn't come on, right? I mean, for some reason, when so, I click on the Zoom are, link, are you I trying can... to present the screen from the uh, from a PowerPoint? No, 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 no. This is supposed to be a Google slide. Okay. Uh, Google slide. So, Raju, you could also email the slides to me. Uh, no, actually, right. It should work out. I'm just uh -huh. okay, okay. Okay. I think I think I'm I'm fine. Now. One minute, just a second. Okay. I think I am there almost. Let me see. Uh, how do I how do I get to the full view? Then I think uh, now everything will work out fine. I'm not able. Okay, I think I'm I'm kind of right, good to go. So please tell me if you're able to see my screen. Yep, I think we. Yes. 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 All right. All right. So um, then, very good. So I think now I should be done very quickly. Let me just open my this one presentation now. Sorry for that small delay. I had it on, but uh, I had to close it because uh, we had to get the Zoom going. I had to go to my drive. Right, I think we are all set now. Okay, now are you able to see it full screen? Yes, Professor. Yeah. All right. Thank you for bearing with me. Is, is it coming full screen yet? Uh, uh, yes. Just a second, I think it should load. All right, now I can see it. Are you able to see it too? Yes, yes, yeah. okay. go ahead. Okay, so so right, let me start with my slide on uh, acknowledgement, right? Which is which is a, which is an acknowledgement to all my students who's been uh, who've been my research scholars, both the PhD and MS, right? These are all students, some from uh, many from the past, some from ongoing, right? Some are ongoing students. Uh, 
Uh, so basically, these are the backbone, right, of the lab. You know, as, as is the case, I guess, with every lab right, around the world. And uh, let me also mention that we have a very, right, along the way, right, we would like to have a strong impetus for outreach, right, which also means that, you know, we are very keen about hiring young foreign faculty. And of course, you know, I've shared this link out there, which you can actually click on later for those of you who want to understand how this entire thing works, because I don't have the time to go to the exact details of each of these mechanisms. But just you know, click on the link and you will know, you know what information you want out there. We're interested in exchange of you know, international, uh, international grad students facilitating you know, uh, this one foreign faculty visits, maybe for a month or so, or even more if needed, then join papers and talk venues attract you know, high quality students for PhD and, uh, and also right, try to attract exceptional Indian uh, PDFs. And also of course, I'm in the process you know, encourage industry participation. And, uh, and uh, you know, along the way, we also want to, uh, yeah, right. And uh, okay, so why, uh, so are we, are we really up there? So in a sense, right, I just wanted to give you, give you a sneak peek into our recent research activities, right, of the IPCV lab. And I'm glad to share with you that in the last five years, we have had about 17 regular papers in A-star conferences, such as CVPR. Those of you who work in vision, right, I know would all be very familiar with these conferences, CVPR, ECCV, AAAI, AC, ICCV, and so on. And then and almost an equal number of journal papers in TIP. Time, EIJC, and so on, right? So, so we are one of the most active research groups in the area of computer vision in India, and uh, and I thought, right? And I thought I'll spend, you know, uh, spend a small amount of time trying to highlight some of the theme and trying to talk about, kind of give you a glimpse. That's why I call it a sneak peek into some of the recent research activities that we've been doing in our lab. So I kind of set the tone, and then of course, then we will move on to things that we want to look uh, look ahead, right? In terms of what we want to do as part of the Center of Excellence. Uh, so let me kind of move on to the next one. Uh, so, so, so the first thing, right, that I wanted to just introduce was, was about it was about the motion deep learning problem. This is a CVPR a regular paper, a 2020 paper, and here, right, we, I mean, motion blur until about a few years ago, right, it was very important. I mean, in order to see sharp images, people don't like to see, right, I mean, images that are blurred. But then, off late, and it has gained even more importance because. Because most of the I don't, a deep net a deep networks are be are, are kind of say, right, typically trained with sharp images and therefore right when they when they are shown blurred images they can they can kind of uh, they can get stumped right so that so the idea is to be able to able to create sharp uh, sharp say, right images I know if you if you kind of give a blurred image as a picture and uh, right, these are typically right, this is typically a hard problem because what could happen is you can have a scene where where you know you can have the camera that's moving you can also have some objects that are moving inside the scene. And on top of that, you can also have you know, some sort of you know, a 3D sort of a depth variation, right? which really means that you need an algorithm or you need a technique that is going to handle all of these together. So in this work, what we did was actually that. And what we did was you know, brought in a sort of an attention mechanism, right? which would also look at the global context as well as the local context through something called a cross-aware attention and something called uh, has a content-aware attention. This kind of a patch hierarchical kind of a framework. And um, and of course, you know, I have the kind of see details here. For those of you who are interested, we can kind of you know look at the details later when you have a Q and A session, if there is time. Uh, anyway, right? I mean, uh, so these uh, so these slides are going to be up there for for all of you to kind of see. And uh, and then uh, let me just share you one of the outputs that we have here. So as you can see on the left, this this is a blurred picture, and you can see that this guy in the front is is, is quite blurred as opposed to others. And therefore, right, what happens is we have a deep network that kind of tends to pay. Pay kind of more attention to to regions that are more blurred, which is what which is what it ideally ideally should be doing, right? So which is what it exactly does here. So if you notice, right, it is able to pay more attention on the person that was blurred, and of course it also pays attention to others that are that are relatively also blurred. And then we also introduce a dynamic filtering kernel because because we realize that it's not a great idea to have a kernel that is no no that has a fixed offset. So we introduced right you know, into this deep learning uh, sort of uh, uh, into this deep network also uh, you know, a facility to kind of uh, to, to automatically adapt the offset of the kernel and which is what you see here. So the kernel offsets are typically large for the regions that are more blurred and then small for the other regions, right? And uh, just you know a quick look at some of these pictures. They show one, for example, if you notice this lady out here, you can see a picture coming out very clearly. In our uh, this one, it's kind of a state of the art, art of this method at that time. 
Now, uh, the uh, next one, right, which I want to talk about uh, is, uh, you know, is unconstrained motion deep learning. This is a traditional approach. This is a CBPR 18 paper. So here, right, I mean, we all know that we have cameras now these days that come with multiple lenses, not just two, you can have three, four, and so on. And therefore, one kind of wonders, right, what does one do, right? Uh, I mean, so one of the things is that if you had a blurred picture again, so the second talk is also about something, you know, which is related to motion deep learning. And the idea is that you could take just one image and try uh, some kind of a deep learning, but then, but then, uh, right, given the fact that you have a depth dependent blur, you could actually, you know, you know, utilize the second image also, right? You could have a blurred, because in this case, you have a blurred pair. Now, until our work, there were these other works that were trying, attempting something similar, but they used a constrained sort of a setting, which meant that these two cameras would have to be identical. So we kind of relaxed that. We said that one of the cameras, so you could have a wide field of view, narrow field of view, you could have different exposure times, you could have a resolution, right, which may not be the same in both the lenses. And yet, right, you would want to do a depth estimation, come and come sort of a sort of a deep learning. Right. And we actually showed that this is a fairly ill-posed problem. It turns out that if you try to estimate the motion density function for, for you know, for let's say each of the cameras or each of the images, then what can happen is you could have a drift, right? They could so both MDS could have a mutual drift, which can actually give you the observed images that you're actually seeing, but then you know it can lead to a left-right inconsistency in terms of the stereo cue, right? So we actually solved this problem and we showed that you know in the process, I mean, you could not only estimate that, but then you could also create sharp pictures. And instead of going through everything, I would just ask you to ask you to look at these small zoomed in sort of sub images, right, where you get an idea about you know, what kind of what kind of uh, what kind of sharpness we get, as opposed to other methods which struggle typically, right, when you have cameras that are unconstrained. Moving on, uh, the I mean, next one, right, which I want to talk about is actually bringing blurred, uh, bringing like blurred moments. Now, this is a CVPR 2019 paper. This is the first time, in fact, ever. And until this work, right, people were always talking about creating a sharp picture given a blurred picture. And then we, for the first time, right, talked about how actually, you know, if one looks at how a blurred image is formed. What really happens is, you know, you have a camera in action that is kind of, you know, that is kind of witnessing the scene. And during the exposure time, a lot could happen. Your camera could be moving. You could have dynamic objects, right, which are actually moving in the scene. You could have depth differences, right, people standing in the front, people standing somewhere else behind and all of that. And all these warped versions, right, in a sense, I mean, you have a weighted warp of all these, or a weighted warp of the latent sort of a sharp image, right, which you would like to ideally see. And what happens is you have this average of all of this going on. And when, you know, when the shutter snaps, right, at the time, all that you get is one sort of a blurred picture. So if you just look at a blurred picture, it looks very dull. Of course, you can sharpen it, but then we went one step ahead. And we asked, right, can get a real, real of what exactly happened right, during the time that the shutter was on. So, so I'm going to show this, show this video, right, where you can see that the first image is the first uh, row is all still you know, images, these are all blurred, but then out of the blurred image, we could actually create a video. Right? For example, the last row is our output, where you can see that you know you get a sense for what really happened during the time that the exposure was open. Right? So basically, this was the very first work right, of its kind to actually tell that you, know, you could actually produce a video from, from a single sort of a blurred image. And uh, I would also like you to, you know, for, you know, to kind of right, take a look at this lady's leg, for example. This is a very, very local motion, right? You can see that she's shaking her leg. And, and uh, you know, even something like that, right, you can actually locally capture. So it not only captures global camera motion, it also accounts for any local sort of a, sort of a motion, right, which can happen. And it kind of relives, right, what you might like to see in a kind of a blurred image, right? So kind of very, very first work of its kind. Uh, and of course, you know, this is of course, you know, one more, one more case. Okay, let me go. And now the next one, right, that I wanted to talk about was, uh, was kind of unrolling the shutter. So we all know that, you know, most of the CMOS cameras these days come with a rolling shutter, which means that not all rows of the sensors are exposed to the same camera motion, right? So what the first row sees is probably not the same as what the, what the last row sees in terms of the camera motion. Right? And, and this really matters when the, when the camera motion is fast enough or if there is an object right, which is moving that is moving fast enough, right? uh, you know, as, opposed to the, as opposed to the shutter time and so on. So, so here, right, what we actually did was, so one of the things that you really need is in order to be able to, able to get rectify. And we know that if there is camera motion, then our general notion is that lines will remain lines. And if there is, a, if there is an exposure that is too long, you can at most get a blurred line, but then a line right, will stay as a line. But then what happens is in case of a rolling shutter, when there's camera motion, a line can bend, right? Like for example, in this case, this building that you see here, you can see a bend, right, happening, which is actually not true. The original scene doesn't have that bend. 
But then because of the camera motion, we can end up seeing a bent sort of a bent, you can see bent lines and so on. And therefore, this work actually takes that into account. And it is a kind of a parametric formulation within a deep network. And what we typically solve for is really an X translational motion and then a rotation along, along the Z axis. And we solve for this. And then, of course, and what you really need to do is estimate camera motion for every row. You assume a smooth motion, interpolate it, and then you can actually unwarp in order to be able to see a rectified image. Right. So I'm going to show this blown up picture. So you can see that after rectification, these lines become the building looks uh, looks vertical. Otherwise, it looks like you know one of the wall is curved, the, the wall edge is curved. Similarly, this is inside a tray, right? You can see that you know the the, the, the bent is removed. And, uh, and of course, uh, here are some still images. The, uh, the nice thing about this work was it could do it with just one image. Mm -hmm. Well, during that time, the state of the art was that you, know, you needed multiple images in order to be able to do it, whereas we could show that this could be done with just a single image. Here is a still image, for example, for a certain class like the face class. If there's a rolling channel effect, you can see that you know there's a skew in the face, whereas, whereas after we run our, 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 our method, you now you get the faces as you should normally be able to see them. Right, going moving forward, let uh, we also did uh, you know, we've also done some works on robust super resolution and especially for the unpaired case because that is what is most challenging. And and you know these days people are looking at problems of the kind where let's say you have uh, degradations that are really very severe, you know, not the kind of things that we were seeing like five years ago. And for, and for example, right, you know, we did some work you know, where we showed that even if you had a picture which is as bad as this, and there is no paired version for this, you don't know how the how the high quality image of this guy looks like. I mean, this is called the Wilder phase data set. And uh, and, I, and then and then you know you can't train with with a pair where you where you know the person. Right, so this is kind of hallucinating, but but then hallucinating, you know, in a sense that you know, which kind of which you know sort of emulates what what we as humans do. So what we as humans do is that if you have two pictures, low resolution of the same person, but then if they are say degraded, we still want to sort of say that you know it's the same person. So this kind of a deep network does exactly that, and you can see here the output. So you have a low resolution picture of this guy, and then of course it's very hard to really prove whether this is correct or not. But then uh, you know it can only be a sort of right a qualitative sort of a judgment right here where you kind of see and then you look at the picture and you sort of believe that yes right I mean, it's doing okay right and then the next one that i want to talk about is a degradation of that image restoration this is a recent paper in uh in a in a special issue of jstsp in february 2021 and here right, this is about you know a deraining problem and it's not just for deraining this can be even applied for raindrops or if you have whatever, I don't know, anything that is spatially varying, right? If you had a degradation that was spatially varying, varying right? I mean, uh, so in this paper, what we actually proposed was, you know, estimating or learning, uh, learning a degradation mask that is spatially varying, and then use this mask to sort of guide the reconstruction process. And uh, right, and this mask also tells the kind of reconstruction network where to focus on. For example, when we say this, uh, uh, when we say that this degradation is spatially varying, what we really mean is, you know, there are there are parts of this scene which are totally unaffected or very little, you know, or, 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 or which are seldom affected or very little affected, and there are regions which are which are affected a lot. For example, when I'm going to play this video where on the left you see a rainy sort of a sort of a scene, and on the right where you see that the rain uh, rain streaks have been kind removed, and uh, which is what we mean by a spatially varying sort of a, sort of a degradation. Moving on. Uh, the, the next one that we did was again, right, these are all unpaired, you know, in all these cases, you don't have a sort of, you know, a clean image. For example, you don't have a database. Well, let's say, you know, somebody took a scene on a day when it was very, very nice, no rains and nothing. And then from the same viewpoint, you know, the same person took another picture, right, you know, when there was rain. It's impossible to have situations like that. More so if you're looking at underwater, right, and underwater, it's, it's especially impossible to get a, get a kind of a pair, right, where you have a clean image and then you have you have you know, a pair for that, which is actually a degraded version. All that you have are hazy images. Now, the one right, that I'm showing you is actually a Dwarka. Uh, no, this is from uh, this one. Uh, this place, Dwarka, which is actually a city uh, right in India. Uh, part of it is actually submerged in the water. This is in the banks of the Gomti River. And uh, right, this is a video that was shared with us by the NIO people, and they wanted to see right, if we could if we could actually restore it. So this is a TIP paper of 2019, where we use the idea of local proximity, right, which basically means that the attenuation uh, and and you see air light are the two important factors where, which uh, which kind of which kind of contribute to haze. So we kind of you know assume them to be locally constant, and then we use non-local means in order to be able to estimate the you know ir irradiance. Right. By doing that, we actually show this here. So after doing that, you can see clearly that, of course, you know, in this, we don't have a ground truth at all, right? There's no map, there's no, there's no clean, unclean pair or anything. All that you have is a kind of a hazy picture. 
of, of an underwater scene, of an underwater scene. The one that you see on the right is a, is a reason method that is deep learning based. And the one in the middle is our method. So our seems to be doing reasonably well as compared to a deep learning method that has probably been learned over now several, several, uh, no, what are the right, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of images. Uh, let me now move on to, to kind of right, going forward. What activities have we planned for the center? Right now, we have kind of identified three main areas in which we think are very exciting as we go forward. And, and you will see that these are not just uh, no, just, uh, just an incremental version of what we are already doing. Right? What we are doing, we showed some of those, I showed you some of those things. And going forward, right, I mean, there's a major kind of shift in what we want to do. So we want to do something like multimodal learning. Now that right, we know that the web is flooded with all kinds of data, visual, audio, text, language, all of that, right? So we want to kind of learn the semantic relation. It's kind of loose, you know, there is no kind of tight relationship, but there is a loose relationship that exists between these uh, between these modalities. And we want to exploit them, right? We want to harness them in order to be able to able to solve some uh, joint task, right? And uh, the second one that we are looking at is uh, you know, computer vision for AR, VR, and smart, smartphones. Uh, especially for smartphones, you know, which are kind of handheld and so on, not for the not for the general, not the general AR, VR, right? That let's say everybody probably you know, that a lot of people are doing. And then we are also interested in some kind of large scale surveillance, but large scale surveillance, you know, just from the point of view of road traffic or road traffic management and so on. I mean, not not in its entire sort of generality. Uh, but then, uh, okay, now going forward, okay, now uh, right, just to, just to kind of motivate, right? What we what I mean by multi multimodal, right? I'm going to play this audio first. And and you know and kind of if you hear this audio, I hope you are able to hear. Uh, uh, Professor Chalaba, are you able to hear the audio? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so now when you hear the audio, you know that they're not observed of a bird, but then beyond that, right? You don't have any any idea about, about probably what's happening. Now I'm going to play this video. Right here, all that you see is a bird, right? That's walking around, and then uh, and then all, all that you have is that information, and maybe right, it's doing something. Now, if I combine both, right, if I give you give you a picture like this, where, where the same audio, right, which I played you before, yeah, and now, now you have a lot more information, right? You know that, okay, there's a bird and there's a bird, right, which is also making this noise. And going one step further, right, I can go, I'm going to play this, the next video where you'll hear something. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. Right? Okay, so you so you kind of heard that, right? So what this means is that I mean, right, with the you know, with uh, let's say video alone, with video plus audio plus, plus video plus audio plus some language or plus some text, right? All of this boosts our ability to know what is happening around us, right? And uh, which is exactly okay what we want to do. Now, when I go forward, uh, one of the first things that you know, which, I, which I want to talk about is vision and kind of language, how these two can be married together. And there are already works, and from now on, whatever, whatever right, I'm going to be talking about are all works that have been that have been done by other groups, right? Our, some of our works are, are under review. The ones that I'm sharing here are the ones that are already out there. And if you want to know who has done it and so on, there are these links below, right, which you can click if you want to, if you want to read any of those papers. Now, just to start with, right? This is a caption. So, when you have vision and language, I mean, I mean, you can have you can have so many of these uh, of these uh, of these uh, research problems, right? I mean, which actually revolve around them. One of the first, right? I know, which I thought I'll share with you is about the captioning problem. So, in the captioning problem, what you have is you know you show an image to a to a kind of deep network, and then and then you want it to summarize what's happening right in the image. For example, in this case, you show this image, and then you expect a caption like that to come out. Right, which says here that uh, no, whatever a group of people shopping at an uh, at an outdoor market, right? Which is what you want this kind of a you know a deep network to do, and 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 the way and the way right this is kind of uh, typically done is you have uh, you have a decoder you know which is an RNN typically and you know and say LSTM and then you have an image from where the from where the visual features uh, right you get this could be typically a BGG network or an R or like a ResNet or something and then and then these go go as encoded features and then decode these go as input to a decoder which is your LSTM and then right how then out comes the sentence you can actually go further and then do maybe if you had a video captioning you can do a frame by frame captioning but then frame by frame captioning will lose out on the on the kind of temporal connectivity whereas if you do a do a dense video caption that's when you you can get different captions and then you can actually associate one caption to another right so so basically there are already works in this including some from our own, some from my own lab uh, let me just go back and then uh, the writer uh, talk about uh, talk about another problem which is even more rich in the sense that you know you can start asking things about which is, which is called bqa the question answering so here what you could do is you could show an image and then somebody could ask right oh, so in this case what is she eating 
And uh, again, right, the output, I mean, you want to say that I mean, no, no, right, she's eating, uh, eating a so hamburger. And uh, the idea here is that, right, I mean, you have um, sort of a, uh, so, so you have you know, a text embedding, and then you have an image feature, and then right, these two have to be kind of fused in a particular manner. Of course, you know, there are kind of various ways to do it. You could simply concatenate the feature or, or, or you know, or I mean, you could play some attention, attention mechanism, whatever it is, right? I mean, it is entirely up to you. And then, and then eventually you pose it as a classification problem, right? Wherein at the output, right, you say whether it is hamburger, whether it is something else, and so on, right? You could also go one step further and then you know, could also talk about a multimodal verification problem as, as, as this says, right? For example, in this left picture that you see here, I mean, right, you see a kid next to, uh, right, I mean, next to a dog, and apparently you can ask the sentence, is this, uh, is this child actually petting a dog? And then you can answer, answer with a false or true. And in this case, of course, it's false. And you can go one step further, right? You can also ask, uh, ask uh, you can also look at problems that can use a caption in order to be able to retrieve an image. Right. For example, you know, if I wanted an image like this to come up, I could ask, and you know, I could kind of throw in a sentence like this, which says a child in orange clothes plays with sheep. Now, just just right, you know, just try to bring out all those images, right, which look like that. Now, again, a framework like this requires you to marry the features right, that come from text, right, where, you know, which is a, and then to to what you see, right. So, so in this case, it's the image feature. So, so normally, what is done is a nonlinear mapping. Right, is learned, you know, they'll try to they'll try to marry these two features. And therefore, right, during a test time, right, when you kind of you know when you input a sentence, then then, then that same kind of a nonlinear mapping, which has been learned through several examples, is then brought on, and then, uh, then it is applied on your sentence, and then it finds out with respect to which visual feature you know is this is this is this kind of closest, and then whatever is the, is the image with respect to that, you know, is is basically shown to you. Right. Let me kind of go back, and and I also wanted to talk about another one. You can go one step further. There are works that talk about you know a text to picture. So here, right, somebody just writes up a text, and it's not about searching for an image. It's about it's about you know having a deep network generate a picture of a certain kind. Now, you know, most recent work, right, which came in 2017, not very recent, but a 2017 work talks about you know having two GANs. You know, they call it stack GAN one, you know, stack you know, stage two and stage one and stage two. When stage one, right, you get a rough idea about what is being asked. And then in stage two, right, you use again to go back to your text and then go back to this visual picture that your stage one has been able to able to able to reconstruct, and then use that to actually refine your output. Um, then uh, you could also you could also do a visual dialogue, right? And uh, you should you could also do a grounding, right? I mean a visual grounding. So I'm going to play this video, right, where you see that you know for uh, for a navigation task, language navigation instructions as shown on the top. A key to solving this task is grounding visual concepts mentioned in the instruction, such as banister rail and the round mirror and butterfly sculpture. Prior work. So you saw that. So, so you saw that right, as 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 the right, as it kind of goes through the text, right? It realizes that uh, not that there is a banister, which means that it has to visually ground the text, right? So so this is something like an embodied agent, right? Which wants to navigate from let's say point A to point B. Then along the way, instead of just seeing what is around, and right, if you could also kind of guide it through a textual sort of information, where in this case it is able to ground what you're telling. There is a banister, and then right, and then along the way it also said that there was a round mirror. Right, and then uh, right. I, I think it also said about it talked about a ground mirror, uh, round mirror, and then there was a butterfly structure and so on. So if it is able to ground all of that, then you know it helps it helps it navigate from let's say point A to point B. Okay, moving on, uh, you can also combine, of course, you know, audio. Right, I mean when you have uh, when you have images, you can also combine them with audio, right, in order to solve some very novel tasks. One of the first ones, right, I know, which I intend to talk about is really, you know, creating creating a stereo or kind of what is called a binaural audio from a from a single channel audio, which is a monaural, you know, uh, there is a monaural audio. A monaural is like a mixture of left and right channels, and uh, I know it's an important problem. You know, it's because it's very hard to create a stereo setup that would actually emulate your head uh, sort of a transfer function. Right, because our head is, you know, head has a certain sort of a construct, and it's not often that, right, that, that these people keep speakers that way or keep these mics that way, right? And therefore, one of the one of the nice things is is being able to convert a monaural audio into a binaural or a stereo output, because with a stereo output, right, you get a sense for where the objects are, right? I mean, even if you don't see the image, you get a get a sense for something being on the left and something being on the right and so on. That gives you a spatial cue, and then images are fantastic in that sense, right? Images carry a very strong spatial cue. 
and uh, and uh, right, which is what which is what something like this would actually exploit. So uh, right, I'm going to just play this play this video for you. And if you've got a, okay, right, 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 let me just pause for a moment. I'm telling you that if you have a headphone on, and right, you you will be able to see that when the car is on the left, right, you'll be able to hear hear you know sort of you know a sort of a dominant sound in your left. Uh, I left this one headphone, and then as the car veers and then you know takes a U-turn and goes the other way, you should be able to see a shift, right, in terms of what you can hear. Okay, now I'm going to just play this. This is a monaural audio. Okay, this is a monaural audio. There's no stereo. Now, so this is binaural, right? If you had your headphones on, you will be able to, right? You would have been able to see that. Now here is another, here is some instrument, right? So these people are using. Okay, so in this case, if you're wondering what, why would they want to do it if there is just you know one instrument, you can also do it if they have your multiple instruments. But then even if one instrument, you want to get a sense for from where it is being played, right? And therefore, you know, it's important even for such. Uh, right for you know, such a problem you can actually go one step further and then you can talk about you know talk about uh, locating or you know do a doing a sound source a kind of a separation right and for that right, i'm going to play this video and the nice thing about the second one is that you know there are no i mean you don't have really a kind of a ground truth right because in most of these right you don't have you don't have ground truth labels and yet you have some kind of a weak supervision going on which helps you which helps you to helps you to kind of see do this now now i'm going to play this video first so that you get a sense of what is what is happening and then i'll kind of see come back and come back and uh, right, talk about talk about right, what it is sorry let me go back one minute uh, Let me go to the previous slide. Yeah, here. Okay, now. Okay, now if you if you actually hear, right, there are these two people. Yeah, so so you could see that you know there was there was a sound source separation, right? That was clearly happening, right? So so on the one hand, you could you could just hear to violin, or, or I mean, if you chose to just you know, hear to the flute, right? You could do that, and, and all of this with some with some very very weak supervision, right? In the sense that here here uh, no the kind of visual cue is simply the fact that right, you have seen certain objects. Right, and so in the sense that you know you've seen a flute. I mean, which which you know which of course you can have deep networks that can tell you that you have a flute in the scene. You can have you know, right. I mean, you can you can even know that right, there is a violin in the scene and so on. And this uh, this works on the fact that there is a kind of a co-separation, and right, which happens. Co-separation is very similar to this kind of a co-segmentation, right, which we are, which we are all familiar with. But here the co-separation is something like you kind of mix two right, mix a video one and video two, and then at the output you expect right each of those each of those audios to emerge. But at the same time, right, the image you comes in the form that you expect that you know if let's say you know if in two videos you saw you saw you saw the same instrument, right, in the sense that you know, both are let's say flute or something that you expect the sounds to also be close, right? That is the only supervision that it really uses. So I you know there is no there is no there is no very hard supervision, right, which is actually going on. And with just that, right, I mean uh, okay, you are able to achieve something like that. Uh, then, Raju, you have five minutes. Yeah. And then, and then, of course, right, I mean, you can also do some kind of a grounding, right? Or, which means that you, know, you can have a speech out here, right? I mean, and then while while somebody is speaking, you might want to relate as to what in the image, right? Does this kind of correspond to? So, for example, right, the red one, the red one is about you know snow on the top, right? Which is what is being is being shown here. And then this blue thing is about flowers with a red, uh, no, the red flowers, right? And so on inside a garden. And then this visual grounding, right, is also a very nice problem. Can be used for video parsing. And so on, but then, uh, but then it's not true that all is hunky dory, right? Because what can happen is, you know, many of these labels are very weak, or many of these labels are noisy. For example, right? I mean, you know, here is a situation where, let's say, somebody, somebody, you know, says that here's the right label for weightlifting, and here it's background music, which is actually a positive, which is a faulty positive. Okay, so therefore, what can happen is a similar weightlifting. Otherwise, what will be a true positive is silence. Now, what happens is when you actually mix up labels like that, which is not in your hand, right? really you don't know which one is correct. And therefore, in such a case, what can happen is this can become a faulty, uh, you know, so when you do kind of a contrastive learning, right? this could become a faulty negative for this guy, and this background music could be a faulty, a faulty kind of a negative you know, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, right? for the other one. 
Okay, so so in that sense, you know, all is not hunky dory. So we have a long way to go, right? And uh, and then right going forward, so the vision challenges are many, right? I mean, as I said, you have to harvest large scale annotated data, you have to deal with noisy labels, unsupervised and weakly supervised learning, design runtime efficient, multimodal, multi right, multi multimodal models, and then interpretable and explainable models, right, is what you're looking for, and so on. And and even the metrics are not really very clear; they don't seem to align very well with our human sort of a judgment. Then moving on, we also want, I also wanted to talk about this other area, which is about computer vision for AR and VR, mainly from a smartphone kind of a point of view. So, for example, right, I mean, you could have something like this, where where as you drive through a road, right, you want to you want to you want to sort of right, you know, bring in something into the seat, something like this, right. So here is the natural scene, and you sort of insert an object right into the scene in order to just simply enhance a viewer's experience. It could be that. Or, or, for example, it could also be super resolution where it is gaze driven. For example, if you're interested in this area, that is what you know, brings up, that is what gets super resolved. Or you keep moving your gaze and then, and then you want to be able to super resolve things of interest, right? These are again things you know, which you can do on a smartphone. Uh, but uh, then as far as, the, as far as our own research uh, you know, sort of you know, path ahead is concerned, and we, are, we are more interested in doing this for, uh, this for mobile, mobile cameras, we want to do it for multi-lens cameras, augment videos with realistic rendering, enhance your viewing, your viewing sort of capabilities, and then do a collaborative AR where there could be multiple users and so on. And finally, right, I'm just going to go talk about intelligent large-scale surveillance. This is again an important problem. I mean, one can talk about lots of things, recognition, traffic management, and, and all that. But then, but then the point is, uh, but then the point is, right, we are going to be focusing only on roads. And especially Chennai, where I live, right, is supposed to be becoming a smart city. And one of the things that we thought we could do that could be very interesting, right, is to be able to is to be able to right bring in, uh, you know, bring in some amount of inference, high level inference into the city road traffic, such as traffic jams. We should be able to report about traffic jams, accidents, crowd gathering, and so on. Maybe some kind of weak supervision that can do in order to be able to classify vehicles as bikes, autos, and cars, and so on. And of course, the the, the key challenge is that there are going to be lots of wide intra class variations. And then you have a height sort of a density of vehicles, right? I mean, and especially in you know, in India. And then you also have to kind of deal with the pollution and so on, right? And uh, and then of course we would also want to want to extend this to the situation where you can do weather agnostic surveillance. And finally, right? Uh, I'm also happy to share with you that among international faculty, uh, some international faculty have already you know expressed interest. And uh, here are their names. Uh, Professor Chellapa from Johns, Hop uh, Johns Hopkins University, Ashwin Shankaranarayanan from CMU, Vishnu Budetti from uh, MSU, and then Vishal Patel from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, with that, with that, I am done. Thanks for your attention. Um, thank you, Raju. That was a fantastic talk. And I, I don't know if we can all see each other, but uh, let's... Uh, thank you. Can you... Uh, uh, let's see. Let me see. Maybe I can... I'll stop sharing, maybe. I'll stop sharing my slide. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. We see everyone. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's clear your group is doing cutting edge research and uh, especially in certain niche areas in computer vision, uh, you know, deep learning uh, and real practical problems, but uh, very well-founded uh, solutions. And I know you were a pioneer in depth from defocus in the late 80s, 90s. And uh, so you, you really hold a uh, uh, key position in, in the in, in the in related fields too. Very good. And uh, so there are a few questions that I'm seeing here in the Q and A. Uh, and uh, I'll first go to them, and then um, if there is time, I can also uh, uh, ask some questions. Sure. Uh, the first one is uh, from Mahesh uh, Kutkori. I'm doing a research on detection and mitigation of DOS attacks in WSNs. Is it possible to save the machine learning model trained to detect DOS and WS and practically? So I'm not clear about some of these abbreviations, but maybe you do. Could you answer that? Uh, unfortunately, even even I do not know what DOS. I mean, I don't know. Is it like you know, kind of? Uh, I don't know. I don't want to make a wild guess. So maybe you know, is that if, is that uh, that particular person can come out with an explanation for what he means by WSN and DOS? Maybe sure. maybe I can try to answer. Yeah, that is good. The, the other question is, yeah, I would encourage uh, Mahesh to, uh, uh, you know, uh, go and, and, and add to his question. The second question from Mr. Krishna Narayanan is, in your computer vision research, do you use any human or animal brain models? Not really until now, but then if you wanted to do some computer vision for no medicine, like you might want to, but then at this point of time, no, we have not ventured into that at all. 
Okay. Um, there's a question from uh, Narendra Yadama. Sir, could you please send the slides through mail? I think they like to, you know, look at your slides. Maybe it, you could. Sure. Put in, in fact, we have a YouTube channel where this entire thing is being shared. So I think okay. I, I, that is going to be alive for a long time. So I think they can download from there. No issues. Yeah. Ah, there's a question from Kirtan Kaleria. Can the newly proposed use of transformers for computer vision help us enable multimodal learning better? Yeah, 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 yes, absolutely. And in fact, some of those things that I've, that I've kind of talked about, in fact, I've already started using transformers. Yes, absolutely, it's already out there. Okay, um, and the question from Krishna Narayanan in computer vision space, what are one or two most challenging research problems, sort of a grand challenge, and do they come in autonomous vehicle, uh, let's see, uh, context? Well, the grand challenge, I would say, is to be able to kind of right, do a generalization to to tasks that are to kind of to tasks that are unseen, right, or to labels, right, or to or to environments right, which you've not seen before. So I think you know most of it is about right, I don't know things which you've already seen, and which is where deep networks seem to excel. But then, right, if they were you know exposed to exposed to things that they've that they've never been that kind of you know they were never exposed to, and if they could kind of see generalized to such situations, that would be that would be a kind of the holy grail. And in the sense that then then I think you know you're sort of then your then your right deep networks are, are right there in that sense. But right now I think you know their utility is kind of limited, even though a lot of noise is around them. But I think we also know that they have inherent weaknesses. All right. There's a question from Greta Pinero. I am a research scholar in spatial computing. Which fusion method is most suitable for spatio-temporal remote sensing data? Uh, well, I mean, I haven't seen your uh, you know, your kind of see data, but then, uh, but then, you know, you could you could use any of them, right? I mean, in the sense that I mean, I'm assuming that you have kind of a video kind of a data. By the way, I mean, I think when you say you have a spatial kind of a temporal data, it all it all depends upon what your final goal is. Uh, are you trying to try to do do some kind of semantic segmentation? What exactly right, do you want to do? Right? I mean, if you can explain that a little better, but there are already right there are so many works out there that are already doing semantic segmentation and so on, and, and therefore right, you can just go back and kind of look at some of those works to get some ideas. Um, there's a question from Mr. Ayush Patel. Sir, how are we going to deal with noise uh, in deep learning images? Oh, deep learning? Uh, yeah, for the kind of deep learning problem? Uh, okay, for the, for the deep learning problem, right, noise is typically an issue only when you have low light. Right? I mean, I know, otherwise, most of the modern cameras are good, in the sense that most of the images that you, that you capture are you know, right, typically good, when I mean, you don't see so much of noise. But then if you're doing some low light capture, yes, right? That is where that is where noise will be an issue. And there are already these papers, right? There are kind of deep learning methods, right? Which try to take a very dark picture and then try to reconstruct a bright picture and so on. Of course, you know, noise comes, uh, is it the noise with images is typically challenging because it's a signal dependent kind of noise, it's a short noise. And therefore it's more hard to handle it in a kind of traditional way, but then deep networks are out there, right? Which are, which are doing a fairly sort of a good job as of now. Okay, um, so question from Gautam Sri Kumar. What are the challenges in computer vision for AR VR tasks that you specified? Is it the model for the task itself or is it that the current models cannot be used directly on mobile devices? Yeah, so one thing is right, you want these things to be light, okay, right? That is one thing because you want to be able to run them right, on a phone. But I feel that the main challenge would be to use a display of a cell phone. Right, in order to be able to split it in a manner that that you could stream videos of a certain kind, where you automatically get an enhanced experience. Right? I mean, I know we already we already have some ideas about it. Some of my students are working on it, but uh, but yeah, right, so, you know, so to say, the focus is going to be on smartphones, and therefore, right, it's you know, even to even to kind of pose a problem, right, in that in that, in that particular domain could be very interesting. See, for example, you know, you know, uh, see, for example, as I said, I mean, you know, if you're kind of watching a scene and suppose you feel that how would the scene look like if it was raining today? Right? Something like that is not out there yet, right? So you have to take so many, so many things into account. You have to take the depth of the scene into account, and then you ought to be able to render it correctly. So all these, right, all these enhanced visual experiences, I don't think they are yet there at all. And therefore, and I feel that that particular thing is still wide open as far as smartphones are concerned. I think we have a long way to go. And, and I think no, that's why it's interesting too. Okay, um, this is a question from Tangamani Viramani. Dear Dr. Rajagopalan, could you please explain a little bit more about the gaze estimation and super resolution problems for smartphones for AR, VR applications? Oh, yeah, I think he's my old student. 
anyway, but uh, that name rings a bell. But well, anyway, we say he is my former student, not old or young. Just kidding. Sure, agree. Former student. Ah, okay, Tangamani. Hi. Uh, well, uh, so you see, so you're asking about gains in super resolution. Uh, well, super resolution. I think the main challenge is, you know, you want to be able to move to move to a phase, right, where where you no longer expect kind of bad data. In fact, right, we have seen that, you know, sometimes when you would look at industrial inspection images and so on, right, there is so much of a difference between the between the LR and the HR, and there's no way that you can map them, you know, so very easily. And therefore, super resolution should be really heading that way, and I think you know, it is. As far as gaze is concerned, right, I think it's more about the hardware that you want to you know, build inside your head mounted model. So, so really, I don't have much to say there. It's more about the hardware that can tell where your gaze is, and then use that as a, sort of a guide to be able to enhance your experience in a smart. Uh, yeah, uh, Mahesh has come back. Uh, DOS is denial of services, ah, which basically yeah. is an attack on and WSN is wireless uh, sensor networks and so on. I think. The closest thing I can think of is adversarial attacks on deep learning uh, algorithms. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, if you want to comment on, uh, you know, in the context of computer vision. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'm not a wireless guy. Okay, but, uh, but I know that right, deep networks are already in the frame wireless too. But then all that I can say is, you know, with respect to, with respect to adversarial, adversarial robustness, Right, when you have something called a black box and a white box kind of attack, right, as far as our area is concerned, we're within kind of computer vision, I, I'm not so very familiar with respect to what would happen right in your domain, which is the wireless domain. But then, yeah, but then you know, we have certain ways to kind of deal with deal with you know, you know, adversarial kind of robustness. Yeah. Right? I mean, the one thing um, black box where we know nothing, and then white is when we know when we know something about what kind of degradation to expect or what kind of adversarial attacks to expect. Um, there's a question from Ms. Jayanti Pragatishwaran. Can the proposed approaches work in medical imaging problems and convert the image into a super resolution image? Uh, yeah, it's already there, right? Except that as far as medical is concerned, you have to be a lot more kind of see a lot more sort of careful because typically right, super resolution algorithms are also meant to kind of are also said to hallucinate in the sense that right, they try to fill in gaps which are not there. And typically they do a good job, but then medical imaging, they're probably right. I mean, every fine little information really matters. You have to be more careful, but I know that right, there are already these super resolution algorithms which have kind of gone into the, gone into the you know, now medical domain. But that I think you know, it's more about a data transfer that seems to be a more, that seems to be a bigger issue than actually doing something like super resolution. From what I understand is the data transfer is a doctor sitting somewhere and then he wants to see the pictures and the data transfer seems to be a more sort of, uh, no, a more whatever right, more relevant problem as of now, but super resolution, yes. But then you have to be a little careful how you're applying it, right? In order to be able to, in order to make some inferences, right? Um, so, Raju, there are a total of 44, uh, I mean, 46 questions. So, I guess uh, we can't uh, cover them all. Cover all of them, um, yeah. There are some questions uh, asking you uh, about what your expectations, uh, you know, in your group that somebody wants to join and, and get a yeah, yeah. I, think right like I think I will uh, uh, suggest to uh, them, you know, just to contact you via email. Yeah, absolutely. Um, somebody is asking for suggestions for a term paper uh, with mathematics and computer vision, and I'll again recommend that they uh, uh, contact you via email. So that was a very uh, engaging uh, Q and A session. I have, uh, as a moderator, I guess I'm entitled to one or two questions. So the first question is. We are all moving to you know data-driven mode, but there is still physics uh, that one can exploit, especially uh, dealing with deep learning problems and so on. So, what do you think we could do to kind of have a, a nice balance, uh, or a hybrid approach uh, that exploits data as well as the underlying physics of uh, degradation? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, as you rightly said, we are already heading that way, right? I mean, you know, we are we are already seeing such kind of say, networks. I mean, so wherever there is there is a model, right? I mean, which is which is which is absolutely correct in the sense that you don't have any doubt, and the and the physics of the image formation says so. Then it is always safe to you know, incorporate something like that right into a network so that you so that you kind of reduce the number of unknowns that you have to learn because certain certain things are known and they come from they come from uh, they come from pure physics and therefore it, it makes absolute sense to in, we should in fact right inc incorporate such things inside the model so that the overall unknowns that we have to learn come down and in fact in fact our own deep network is able to head the way where it should otherwise otherwise you know, it could be lost if you throw everything wide open. In fact, I mean, we already did something for SEM images, right? I mean, I don't know if, uh, if I were to just mention that. We already made, made use of some of the underlying physics that causes charging effects and so on in a SEM image, and some of that we actually implemented and used it. 
absolutely correct. Yeah, we, I think we should be heading that way. Wherever physics uh, physics stands uh, right next to us, we should use it. Oh, yeah. Um, this uh, question from Ms. Vaishali Tiagi. Sir, have you ever tested soil pH through image processing? Suggest some methods regarding testing. I think uh, this is a little bit outside. Uh, yeah, the more current. application, I think, but, yeah, oh. but we haven't so done that. I would uh, encourage Ms. Tiagi to contact Professor Rajpopalan via email and, and, and maybe if he has the answer, he will tell you or he, at least he can point to someone who probably knows the answer. Now, the last question I have is, you already um, discussed it, uh, multi-modal uh, um, you know, learning is, is a really a very exciting area and uh, finding inconsistencies between text and images and videos is, is becoming very important in the context of uh, uh, you know, misinformation, disinformation, and deep fakes and all that stuff. There are a couple of uh, programs that uh, we are all involved uh, in, in, in US. So that's a very uh, promising area. And um, smart transportation, you know, you, vehicle re-ID, again, is a, it's a very well-known problem and uh, it presents a lot of challenges. Uh, what happens is the curated data is a lot better than the actual data captured by traffic cameras. So one has to worry about domain adaptation and so on. So that's again an exciting area. So um, I guess uh, we pretty much have come to uh, the end of the program. Um, um, so I, I want to thank uh, Raju for uh, giving a, a very energetic and uh, exciting uh, cutting edge uh, um, research program. And uh, we look forward to working with you. And Raju joined my lab in 1998, I believe. He already yeah. Uh, he actually uh, helped us start the gate uh, recognition program. Uh, we wrote papers on that, and it's again coming back uh, in, in different ways. Uh, Raja has been a stellar researcher, and uh, it's, uh, every time I come to Chennai, I make it a point to go to his lab and learn from what he and his students are doing. And uh, as you could see from his uh, uh, talk, uh, he publishes in the best journals and conferences and uh, is a leading researcher in computer vision, signal processing, image processing in India, and I uh, wish him well and uh, many more uh, great papers and students and so on. And uh, I think that at least I know the other two of the other two characters that you mentioned, Ashwin and Vishal Patel, who are amazingly intelligent uh, and enterprising researchers. So I think you're going to have a lot of fun. I mean, we're all going to have a lot of fun. Let me put it that way. So uh, when the pandemic is over, uh, well, I'll make sure I, I drop by your uh, lab and uh, we'll chat more. But meanwhile, we'll continue the conversation. I want to thank everyone thank for you. attending. Thank you, Professor Chalabha. It was an honor having you. Oh, no. for having you. On board. Thank you very much for your time. Sure. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Chalapa. I mean, I would like to thank you once again for taking your time and uh, making this possible. Uh, so, Professor Raj Gopalan, like, uh, I personally enjoyed your webinar and astonished with your project. I, I would like to thank the audience for joining this session and uh, in giving an enormous support every time. I'm looking forward to meet you, everyone, in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Good day for you.